everyone. <laughs> Welcome and it's so great to see you here today. Let's just hear from scriptures as we begin our service. Psalm 33 verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen for his own inheritance. And Deuteronomy 14 verse 2 says, You have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God, and he has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. I read recently that singing is breathing out our prayers. And what a lovely analogy that is as we respond to our scriptures. So please stand with the worship team and let's breathe out our prayers to our awe-inspiring God with pure hearts this morning.
Please be seated. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. I'd like to invite our elder, Jeff Oakes, to come up and pray for us. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. See how we empty our minds of the, the clutter and the stuff that goes on outside us today and come quietly before our God and know that He is here with us and near to us and to pray to Him. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us this morning, Lord. The beauty of your creation and your glory we see around us as we look out the windows here as we have driven to this church this morning, Father God. Thank you that, that you are the God who does this for us. And we see that amazing part of your work around us. Father, it is indeed good to be worshipping together again like this. Maybe not like we've been used to in mid months past. But Lord God, if... This is what we have to do at this time, in these strange, unusual times we are living in. Father, we thank you <clears throat> that we can be here together again, Lord, and we pray that we will be filled with the Spirit and, and over, overflowing with love for you, knowing of your love for us. Father, we pray for those that are, can't be with us today. We know there are others who are not ready to come back to us yet, Lord, or, or who who just can't get here at the moment, Father God. But we, <clears throat> Father, we ask your blessings upon those people, Lord, that they, they can know the nearness of you that we feel here. And even though we are a part in body, Lord, let them remember that we are together. We are one in the spirit. Father, we pray for those who are watching us too on, on the computer screen or, or some other way, Father God. We ask too, Lord, that you people will be uplifted. You will feel the presence of God wherever you are and whatever you're doing, Lord. And, and, that, and that they will know that God is there with them. Father, we pray for this little part of your, your church in, here in Bagara. Lord, for the people here, bless, bless the people, bless this, this congregation, bless the people who, who bring us here together each day. Lord, bless us in all we do. And may this church be a, a little shining light in the middle of this great big bad world in which we live at the moment, Lord. And that may you in people passing, passing by and see the name Coral Coast Christian Church, so that that Christian part will, will resonate with them, Lord, and inspire them and maybe help them to think of other things besides what is happening in our world today. Father God, we pray you'll, you'll bless our outreaches as a church. Lord, mums and kids, the, the men's shed, our mission support, and the people who organise those things, Lord, and, and keep them going and, and help other people to know, to help to know, to get to know that, that message of Jesus and his love for them. And also, Father, the people within our congregation who are quietly witnessing Away, just just a, a kind word or, or a pleasant hello to, to neighbours and friends, Lord. That we just pray, Father, that, that all of us can be witnesses just by our attitudes, by the way we speak, the way we behave. And we thank you, Lord, that, that we know that that is, that is good witness for others. Father, we pray for our pastoral team, Brian. <clears throat> Carolyn, Lisa, their families, Lord, and, and their work here, Father God. And we know each of those are involved heavily in, in other organisations and, and ways of bringing the word of Jesus and God to, <clears throat> to other people, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for their dedication, Lord, and, and the things they do week by week. And we pray, Lord, for your strength to be with them, for health and well-being, and for their faith to remain strong and vibrant. 
We pray, Lord, for the elders, for their willingness to provide spiritual support for the congregation, for the pastors. We pray, Lord, for the stewards, their dedication to the practical matters of our church, the business matters. We know, Lord, even as a church, we still have to be bound by laws and, and do the right thing in, in certain things. And we thank you for that. And we know Pastor Brian will be talking about that shortly. But again, Lord, we, we pray for your, your strength and your blessings upon our team of stewards. And we pray for the other people within our congregation, Lord, who, who do things, who, who have that great servant attitude, Lord, and they support this church. And, and bear out your love for them and, and for us. Lord, we think of the worship team, those in the sound booth up there, those who record the service and edit and prepare it for Lady on the internet so that others can hear what we are about and hear the word of God. Lord, we pray for those who prepare the building for the service each, each Sunday. Extra work needs to be done due to the COVID-19. We know that and we, we love those people, Lord, and, and pray, Father, for for strength for them that they will continue doing this this vital work we know pray for those who clean the buildings the facilities tidy up the grounds mow the lawn lord that is all all your work and we thank you and bless them for their willingness to use the talents that you have given them we know lord god that there are people within our congregation who are, who are ill, who are troubled or confused, have things going on in their life, Lord, which is difficult for them to handle. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will be with those ones. You, you will let them know your presence there. Let them know of your, your love, your desire for, for them to know you and know that you are there. No matter what the situation is, you are there and you can provide comfort for them and for their loved ones. We give you thanks, Lord, for answered prayers in cases we know, Lord, where people have been ill or, or troubled, Lord, but are now, have returned to good health, returned to peace in their lives. And Father, we thank you that, that you are there, that our prayers are answered, Lord, sometimes not as we think or when we think, but we thank you, Father God, for those people who have returned to health. Lord, and again, we thank you for this part of our, our church, Lord, this, this part of the, the body of Christ. May it be a, a shining light of your glory. And may each one of us, doing what we can, be joined together in that body of Christ, the church here. And Lord God, we pray these things this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, who, when he was asked by his disciples, how do we pray, Master? How do we pray? Jesus answered this way, and I'd ask you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand and let's sing, breathing out our prayers in a spirit of worship and with a heart of repentance. Thank you. 
Could I ask the offering collectors to come forward, please? After you have given your tithes and offerings, would you please stand and join in our worship song? What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no dark times but we have hope because light always wins when we feel low Lord Jesus you are our hope 
and when we feel weak you Jesus are our strength and our healer we are never forsaken so Lord we who gather here today thank you for the gifts of riches and abilities so to share through our tithes and offerings we have been blessed abundantly by you Jesus the Christ you who loved us so much that you gave yourself for us your friends in your precious name we pray amen Good morning and welcome this morning. It is good to affirm the goodness of God and lift up his name. Um, hopefully you picked up your newsletter or were given your newsletter when you came through. Uh, please take that with you. Um, you will see two inserts in there today. Uh, one is something that I've written, and I do this before each election. Uh, I provide you with a list of the candidates in ballot paper order. So I'm not telling you how to vote, I'm just providing you with a list of the candidates. Uh, so this t uh, today has on one side the district of Burnett, that's if you live along the coast, uh, or on the other side the district of Bundaberg for those who live in Bundaberg. And it just simply lists the candidates in order for those two electorates. Now, if you don't live either in Burnett or Bundaberg, sorry, uh, you'll have to go and do your own research on that. Uh, so please take that, pray through that, so that when you go to vote, whether you're going to pre-poll or whether you're going to a polling place on election day, you will already have prayed through the candidates and have worked out in your mind before God for whom you ought to vote. The other insert is something provided by Family Voice Australia. Uh, it's the coloured one, and it simply lists uh, on some issues that are not really highlighted in the mainstream media. It just simply lists the positions of the two major parties in Queensland. So the LNP and the Australian Labor Party. So you can take and read through that as well. Let me come and read scripture to us this morning from Paul's letter, first letter to Timothy. Um, at the moment we're conducting a series, a small mini-series of messages about how we as believers in Christ ought to relate to government. And last week I talked from Romans 13 about the general biblical principle that government has its place. It's uh, uh, established by God and we as believers are to be in subjection or in submission to the governing authorities. Paul expands on that idea when he writes to Timothy. So in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the first four verses, the words are on the screen, but if you've got your Bible or device and you want to follow them, please do. Paul says, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Lord, we do thank you that your written word is true and we acknowledge our God that it is your word to us as your people. We would pray our God that your Holy Spirit, who inspired the Apostle Paul to pen those words, will speak with us today in Jesus' name, for we ask that for his name's sake. Amen. Well, isn't that a handsome-looking gentleman? Oh, no? Some of you didn't like him. 
I didn't take the picture from a, an election core flute or placard. Uh, it's someone who is long gone and who is not standing as a candidate in the forthcoming Queensland state election. It's a picture taken from a statue carved from marble of the Emperor Nero from Roman times. Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus. That's a great name, isn't it? <clears throat> he was the fifth Roman emperor in the Judeo-Claudian dynasty, which ruled the Roman world from 27 BC to 68 AD. He was adopted as heir by the Emperor Claudius, who was his great uncle and also his stepfather. It was a kind of incestuous family arrangements in the Julio-Claudian dynasty. He succeeded to the throne in the year 54 AD when he was only 16 and a half years of age. Now you have to think about that. How many 16 and a half year old young men would be ready to assume the rulership of an empire? He didn't even have his driver's license. Oh, you didn't need it. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize, didn't realize, you didn't need a driver's license for a chariot. Ah, uh, okay. Now, he ruled for 13 years and eight months, and he died by his own hand on the 9th of June in the year 54 at the age of 30. Still young, most of you would say. Only 30. You see, when, Emperor, when Nero turned 16, he had married his stepsister, Claudia Octavia, the daughter of his stepfather, the Emperor Claudius. Nero's mother, who probably poisoned her husband so that her son would ascend to the throne, thought that she would be able to rule through her son. But five years later, in 59 AD, Nero put an end to that. He had his mother exiled and arranged for her to be executed. He had a number of affairs. And in 62 AD, he divorced, exiled, and then had his, his wife, Claudia Octavia, executed. That's kind of making sure, isn't it? Divorced, exiled, and just to make absolutely sure, have her executed. commentator said that he lost all sense of right and wrong and he listened to any form of flattery. Now in 64 AD the great fire of Rome erupted in July of that year and countless mansions and public buildings and residences and temples were burned to the ground over a fire, in a fire that lasted for over a week. And Nero accused the Christians of starting the fire to shift any suspicion from himself because it was well known that Nero wanted to build a new grand palace for himself in those parts of Rome that were the epicenter of the great fire. Christians were arrested and brutally executed by being thrown to lions and other beasts, crucified 
or dipped in tar and burned alive. In AD 65, the following year, Nero kicked his new wife to death. Although some said that maybe she died following a miscarriage. Maybe both were true. In 67 AD, Nero married a young boy named Sporus, who greatly resembled his second wife, Nero had him castrated and tried to make a woman out of him and married, in inverted commas, him as if he were a woman. Nero was not a nice man. He was far from being a godly ruler, both in how he treated his own family members and how he treated the people of the empire that he ruled. But it is still in that context that both the Apostle Paul in Romans 13, and the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 tell Christians to submit to the king. Both Paul and Peter knew the sort of man who was their king, their emperor, and yet they both say, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Christian people were to live in submission to the governing authorities of their time. Now, for us, that's in some ways a difficult thing to come to terms with. How could Scripture command the followers of Jesus to submit to the authority of such wicked, godless rulers as the Emperor Nero? And that's not an easy question to answer. Let me make a statement to us today. Quite simply, government, whatever sort of government, needs our prayers. Government needs We who know Jesus Christ and have submitted ourselves to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, government needs our prayers. Firstly, because government needs God. (laughs) I hope agree on that statement. Government needs God, regardless of what sort of government it is. Now, Paul had been under house arrest in Rome, awaiting trial before the emperor because he had appealed when he was accused in Jerusalem. He had appealed as a Roman citizen to the emperor's ruling. Paul knew the sort of man that Nero was, but he was still willing as a Roman citizen to abide by Roman justice. It would seem that Paul's accusers did not turn up for the trial in Rome. And so Paul had been released, possibly in the year 62 AD, but he had spent some months at least up close and personal with Nero. (laughs) Now, not living in the palace, he was under house arrest, but going to trial before the emperor and the emperor's closest advisors. Paul understood that government needs salvation. Paul could 
see what Nero and his closest advisors were like. And he knew that they needed the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul tells Timothy to instruct the believers in Ephesus, where Timothy was, to pray on behalf of all men, and especially for kings and all those in authority, because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God raises up individuals to positions of authority, but that does not mean that those individuals, those ministers of God, behave in godly ways and rule with godly wisdom. They need to submit to Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus had declared before ascending back into heaven, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He had commissioned his followers to proclaim that message and to disciple all people into a right relationship to God through himself, Jesus Christ. Kings and all those in authority are not exempt. They need salvation. They need to submit to Jesus' authority, regardless of how they come to power, whether it's simply through dynasty, as in Nero's case, or in the case of the monarchs of the British realm, come through dynastic accession to power or whether they come to power through seizing power with violence, whether they get elected to governing office, they all need to submit to Jesus Christ. It was Lord Acton who said in 1887, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. (laughs) It's a rather disappointing thought. We shouldn't be surprised when those in governing authority are revealed to be less than perfect, less than ideal, when it's revealed that they, whether however they've come to power, make bad choices and bad decisions. We shouldn't be surprised. You see, the biblical principle is that all human beings are sinners. And sin affects every area of their lives. Donald Trump is a sinner. Joe Biden is a sinner. Scott Morrison is a sinner. Daniel Andrews is a sinner. Gladys Berejiklian is a sinner. Anastasia Palaszczuk is a sinner. All those in governing authority are sinners. And sin affects how they live their lives. It affects the choices they make. Isn't that the biblical truth? So when an individual gains power, however he or she has come to that power, unless he or she acknowledges that there is a higher power to whom he or she is accountable, the tendency and the opportunity arise to abuse the power for personal gain. In our system of governance, a constitutional monarchy and a parliamentary system, we have a ceremony that crowns our monarch. Now, most of you were not alive 
when our current monarch was crowned. 1953. When Elizabeth II, Queen of Australia, she's also Queen of a few other places too, but from our point of view, Queen of Australia, was crowned. <clears throat> and in that ceremony, as an intrinsic part of the ceremony, the Archbishop of Canterbury says, our gracious Queen, to keep your majesty ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. And the archbishop hands the monarch a copy of of the Bible. And then the moderator of the Church of Scotland says, as the Bible is handed over, here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Although he probably says it in a Scottish accent. intrinsic to the monarchy within our system of governance is this recognition that there is a higher authority that the monarch before he or she in this case in 1953 it was elizabeth before the crown was placed on her head she was reminded that she is to be in submission to a higher authority, to an absolute God who has given his written word, and that's the basis for law within our society. Now, isn't that a good thing? Now, whether you're a Republican or a monarchist, that surely is a good thing. You know, a couple of decades ago when we had a, a vote in Australia about whether we ought to have an Australian head of state and become a republic, some people at the time asked me, Pastor Brian, what do you think about this? How should we vote? And I said, well, you know, biblically, the scriptures do not prescribe a particular form of governance. You know, when Paul writes these words, the highest governing authority was Emperor Nero, a philanderer, a murderer, a wife beater. Like, it doesn't tell us how it should, a nation or an empire should be governed. But you know, I think what we've got at the moment is working okay and if we were to change to become a republic at this point in our nation's history i somehow don't think we would be writing in a requirement for our president to respond to a similar words that our monarch was required to respond to back in 1953. Can you imagine that? If we were a republic and we've elected or appointed our president, that we would be saying, at this point in time as a nation, now Mr. President or Miss, Mrs. President, you need to recognise the Bible is the word of God and you need to be in submission to God. Can you imagine our nation saying that at this point in time? Back when the United States was established, there were Christian influences throughout the whole of the nation. And so its republic system with its president wove in the awareness of a higher authority. 
to whom the president is accountable. In God, we would trust, was woven through their Republican system. Because it was devised over 200 years ago when the Christian faith was overtly upheld within that nation. And how well have all the subsequent presidents followed that? Yeah, well. Our monarch promised to submit herself to a higher authority. Each day in our system of governance, we remind our politicians that they too are accountable. Each daily session of parliament, both at a federal level and a state level, is opened with Christian prayer. Now, for some of those parliamentarians, perhaps most of them, this is simply a ritual. But it is a reminder to those parliamentarians that they are under the authority of Jesus Christ. They are not just accountable to the people who voted them into office, they are accountable to God. Some do not like that reminder. And from time to time, some parliamentarians want to see this opening of parliament with prayer abolished. They claim it's old-fashioned. They claim like it's outdated, that it doesn't acknowledge and affirm all the other religions. And we should, if we're going to have a prayer, let there be an imman and a, and a, a, a Wiccan practitioner and a Buddhist come in and, and, and let's have all sorts of different prayers. The whole point of that is to dilute the sense of submission. I think the opening of Parliament with prayer needs to be retained because government needs God. Without recognition of God, government too easily abuses power and becomes a tyranny. Secondly, and there's only two points today, Government needs our prayers because we need freedom. That's what Paul says in the second half of verse 2. Let there be prayers for all men and especially for kings and all those in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Our prayers for those in authority are not to be shallow, oh God, bless them, type prayers. That's not how we're to pray. We are to pray intentionally that those in authority would exercise that authority to the best to enable people to live godly lives. That's what we're to pray for. We're not praying, oh, Lord, bless the Prime Minister, bless the Premier. That's not how we're to pray. We're to pray that those in authority would use their authority to enable us, the people, to live godly lives. Sometimes that may mean praying for the strengthening of a ruler's position. Sometimes it may mean praying for the weakening or even the removal of a particular ruler. If a government is ruling against God's commands and consistently failing in its God-given responsibilities to promote order and safety in society, to give protection to life and to property, and to facilitate human flourishing, 
then our prayers are to seek that the sovereign Lord God would take that government away. Does that make sense? Now, that's not a license for uprising, for burning down the city, for violently seizing power ourselves. Sadly, in some parts of the United States over these last six months or so, there have been some people who've taken that approach. We will burn down the city unless we get what we want and we want the removal of those in authority that we might replace them with those that we like, that we want to be in authority. There is no license for followers of Jesus Christ to burn down the city. Now, instances of civil disobedience in the scripture are all peaceful. Now, last week I alluded to one of those. In the time of the book of Exodus, the Egyptian pharaoh commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill all the male Hebrew babies. Those women at great personal risk to themselves refused. Next week, we're going to look at an example from the life of Daniel. And most of us would know the stories of Daniel and his three friends in Babylon, where they were commanded to do certain things that were against their God-given truths. And they chose to disobey. but they did it peacefully. They didn't seek to burn down the city. You see, authority still has to be respected and honoured, even if it has overstepped its role. Our prayers and our actions are to be focused on our freedom to live quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. So yes, government has its place and government needs our prayers. So that those who are in authority, however they came into that role, would be aware of the limitations on their power and would rule in a way that facilitates the greatest freedoms and the quietest lives for those under their authority. So, have you been in prayer for our rulers? When the election core flutes went up and the advertisements started appearing on TV and in the newspapers, in the social media platforms, did you go, oh, no, no. Dear, it's election time. Or did you, each time you saw an advertisement, or drove past a core flute, or saw some people standing on the side of the road waving a, a, a banner, and as I saw as I drove into town earlier in the week, did you say, Lord? I want to commit this process to you. Lord, I want to pray for that candidate. Even if I don't like his or her policies or his or her party, I want to pray, Lord God, for that candidate. Not just, Lord, bless them, but pray <coughs> that they would be people if they come into a position of power, would 
rule in such a way as to allow us, the people, the freedom to live quiet and tranquil lives in all godliness and dignity. So having given you that challenge, let me lead us in prayer for our, our national leaders and our state leaders. Lord God, some of us love the political process, but probably most of us are not really that interested. We just simply want to live our lives and get on with our stuff and, and be left at peace and to live quiet and tranquil lives to do the things that you've called us to do. And the, sequ the sequence, the cycle of elections that come up every so often are just, in, for many of us, uh, a an, uh, somewhat annoying distraction. But Lord, we recognise that we before you have a responsibility to pray for kings and all those who are in authority. In fact, it is commanded of us to pray for them. Because you see, Lord, we recognise that all those in authority, be they kings, be they governors, be they prime ministers, be they premiers, all of them are sinners, sinful human beings, and many of them do not know the Saviour who laid down his life to redeem them. Oh Lord, oh Lord, you love those people. You love them and you died for them. Lord God, you want those people to come to know Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. You want them to understand that their authority, their power is not absolute. They are accountable to the one to whom all authority has been given. And Lord, we who have submitted to that one, Jesus Christ, Lord, we want to bring before you our nation's leaders. And we want to bring before you our state's leaders. And we would ask our God that you would be at work in their lives. Lord, this week as we drive past core flutes on the side of the road. Lord, may we take a moment or two to pray for those candidates whose faces appear on those signs. As we see advertisements on our TV or on our social media platforms, Lord, may we take a moment to pray for those candidates. And Lord, as we exercise the freedom that we have to be involved in the process of appointing people to authority in our state in a couple of weeks' time. Lord, may we have weighed the issues and evaluated what the, the, the candidates are standing for and cast our vote wisely. Because we are under authority. Your authority, Lord Jesus, and under the authority of the state government that you will raise up in our state of Queensland for the next four years. Lord, we want a government that will grant to us as citizens of this state the freedom to live tranquil and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. We ask that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel says in his prayer, chapter 2, verse 37, 
You, O King, are the King of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. Let's stand together for our last song. Jesus, God's righteousness revealed. The Son of Man, the Son of As you leave today, please take this blessing with you from Numbers 6, 26, for you and your families and your decisions. May the Lord look upon you with favour and give you peace. And so I pray that you will have a tranquil yet joyful week. God bless you all until we meet again. And just a little reminder before you go, Rose is selling her biscuits today. Okay. What have you got there? Anzac biscuits? Anzac biscuits? Great. <laughs> so please help by purchasing a packet or two. Thank you and God bless you again.